Welcome back to part two of the unobvious things about Sony's Alpha 99.2. These insights, by the way, are brought to you by the new ebook on the camera, The Freeprint Archives Guide to Sony's Alpha 99.2, available at this website right here. It's really good, and don't forget there's a two week money back guarantee in case you don't agree it's the best thing since sliced bread. So, let me talk to you about something that's very unintuitive all the different focusing modes. And we're going to start from the ground up. This is a horizontal line. And I'm going to turn on just one focusing point of the 399 that are available. And here's how I'm going to do it. First, I'm going to hit the function button. Then I'm going to head over to focus area. Now, you have a lot of different things to choose from. Wide allows the camera to choose from any of the 399. And in a second, I'm going to actually talk about how it makes that decision. But I'm going to jump right by these other ones and talk about this one here called flexible spot. Now, as you can see, well, maybe you can't. I'm going to move this bear a little bit. There's a little tiny square in the corner, in the center. And you can move it using the joystick. You can move it anywhere you want within that very large bounding box. I'm going to choose this one up here. So first, I'm going to show it nothing at all. And as you can see, even phase detect autofocus requires some kind of contrast to, uh, to work on. Otherwise, even without this line, it can't even focus on the wall. And you'll notice by the flashing green light in the lower left-hand corner, the camera's going, hey, I have no idea what to do here. So if you give it no contrast at all, it's going to miss. If you give it some contrast, notice it's missing the horizontal line, but if you switch it to vertical, it hits it almost instantly. Let's try that again, boys and girls. Nothing at all and something. So only vertical contrast can be detected. Let's actually change the spot focusing point to something more in the center. I'm going to move the joystick here. How about right how about right there? Notice the shape of the autofocus point changes from a square to a slight rectangle as it gets into the areas that can detect both horizontal and vertical contrast. Hmm. Let's do let's do vertical here, no problem at all. Let's do horizontal. No problem at all. The ones with a rectangle can do vertical and horizontal contrast. Now, it's actually not quite true. Let me change another setting. One, page four, AF system. Let's switch that to dedicated phase autofocus only. Now, some of you may remember that this camera actually has two kinds of autofocusing systems. The first one is the kind used in the Sony Alpha 7 R2. And that's the kind where you have a whole bunch of autofocus points built right into the sensor. And for technical reasons, they can only detect vertical contrast only. In addition to that, there is a sensor behind that semi-transparent mirror. In fact, that's the only reason that mirror is there. Have a look here. Of course, I got the vertical grip on, so you can't quite see it. But inside there is a mirror. Most of the light goes through that mirror and hits the sensor and the autofocus points that are in the sensor. A third of the light goes up to a dedicated autofocus system, a kind that was traditionally evolved in a DSLR. And that is optimized for fast autofocusing with wide open f-stop. So this one actually gives you the best of both worlds. But not all of its autofocus points will detect vertical and horizontal. Let me demonstrate that to you by turning off some of the autofocus points. Uh, let's see here. Menu. Uh, I think it's on page four. There we go. AF system. We want this one. Normally it's on auto and the camera will decide whether it wants it from the sensor or from the dedicated phase detect autofocus array. You can also say ignore everything on the sensor. Just give me the dedicated autofocus array. I can't think of a reason to turn it off except for when shooting this video. Here we go. I'm going to choose an autofocus point there and I'm willing to bet that this one can only detect horizontal lines and not vertical. Let's see here. Horizontal line. There we go. No problem at all. Let's give it a vertical line. Can't fix it. Ah, sure enough, it can't. It's blind to vertical, but it's not to horizontal. Have a look at this diagram over here. You'll notice that some of those dedicated autofocus points are in yellow and some are in green. The yellow ones can only do horizontal lines. The green ones can do vertical or horizontal. They got what's called a cross type. Then there's that red one in the center. That one is optimized for lenses that are f2.8 or faster, like f1.8, 1.4, things like that. So you got a wide variety. So how is it possible for that one autofocus point to do both vertical and horizontal when in fact 
I could only get it to do one or the other. The answer is the camera, when both are active, will merge those two together. It'll take the vertical uh, sensor from the sensor and it'll take the horizontal sensor from the dedicated autofocus array and make a virtual cross point AF sensor. It's a very cool thing. And let me turn that one back to auto before I forget. So let's switch this back to wide area autofocus, which is the camera's default. And it's also my own default because you want your camera ready for anything. And let's examine the question. <clears throat> if you've got all these autofocus points available to you, how does the camera know what the subject is and what do you focus on? Generally, there's two heuristics. And let me demonstrate that one to you. We've got some uh, focusing charts here. As you can see, it works pretty well. Rule number one says, if you've got two different targets, two different distances away, every time you press the autofocus button, the camera will try to evaluate the distance behind every autofocus point, and it will choose the one that's closest, regardless of whether it's brighter or darker. Cool. Heuristic number two says, ignore heuristic number one if you find a face. I happen to have here a Sears portrait special. So let's replace the autofocus one with something with a face. Notice that even before I press buttons, you can see a square around there. And uh, if it finds a face, that takes precedence over whatever is closest. So that's how the camera just makes its decisions. So what are the other autofocus modes for? Well, in part one of this video, we saw a situation where the camera was fooled to try to, cal uh, try to focus on whatever was closest, but you wanted something else, and you were able to override it using the center button on the joystick once it was assigned to focus standard. There are other autofocus modes as well. You can't switch to them as quickly. You have to actually go into the menus and choose different ones, but here's basically the choices you have. First one is you have zone. Now, don't let this confuse you. There's actually four different types of spot focusing. The first one we saw in part one. It's called the flexible spot. Whoops. Let's try that again. It's called the flexible spot. Oh, you can't see because it, it was behind that black thing. There's the flexible spot. And you can move it everywhere. Now, in case that spot is too small for you, like if you're shooting sports, it's probably too small an area, you have three other sizes for having that spot be. The first one is called expanded flexible spot. You can get to it by just going down one, and instead of one small rectangle in the center, it's surrounded by a total of nine. And you can move those as a big clump, up or down. Now, in order to be able to go outside the periphery like this, you need a hybrid autofocus compatible lens attached. In my book, I have a whole list of what lenses will work that way. So that's two sizes already, just a rectangle or a group of nine you can move around. Can you get bigger than that? Yes. There's a third size, and that is the zone. Why don't they just call it super expanded flexible spot? I don't know. Zoom is like, like 30 squares all together, and you can go left, right, up, and down. So, it's, so those are your three different sizes. In addition to that, you have this. Lock on AF wide. What is that? Well, I'll explain that to you in a minute, but first I want to talk about this feature's predecessor called Center Lock on AF. Both of these features were designed to have the camera automatically track a subject so you don't have to. All you have to do is just wait for the decisive moment. And here's how it works. First, you need to enable it via the menus. It's in camera one, uh, screen five, center lock on AF. This is great for movies, but not for much else because it's too slow. There it is, it's on. Normally, it's best to assign this to a button so you can call it up at any time instead of having to go through all the menus. But basically, here's what's going on. Let me take this off the mount here. What you're doing is telling the camera, see that thing in the center? Memorize it. Press the center button right now, and it'll say, oh, I recognize that. I see the color, I see the shape, and now I'm going to automatically track it, even though it's going left and right, up and down throughout the frame. What happens if it leaves a frame? Well, sometimes it remembers it, sometimes it doesn't. Let's see. Yeah, it found it. Cool. This is great for shooting movies. If you follow the actors around the stage, this is a very good thing. It counts on the fact that the subject has a different contrast and brightness level of the surroundings. If you're shooting one kid in a soccer game and everybody else has the same shirts, this is not going to uniquely identify the, act, the athlete that you locked onto. Well, how can we make this better, said the Japanese engineers. I know. Let's see if we can get the same tracking mechanism 
but without requiring human intervention. In fact, let's go one further. The camera already can decide what the subject is based on either what's closest or whether it finds a face. Use that to identify your subject and then track it automatically. And that's what the lock on AF feature does. It only works in stills and it only works if this center lock on AF feature is turned off. So let me do that one now. Turn it off. And uh, now I'm going to try to, I think there's something else keeping it from happening. Let's change the focus area to expand effects little spot. It's not going to let me. You can see it's grayed out. And the reason is I'm in AFC mode right now, which is what my usual focus shooting mode is. So let me go change that. Let's change it to AFC. So let's go down. Now lock on AF uh, is selectable. And now I can use the left and right joystick buttons or directions to choose different options, all of which appeared in the menu vertically above this one. Uh, a, a flexible spot, the center, the zone, wide. Uh, I'm going to keep it on wide because uh, that's what I like to do. So that's what Lock on AF does. And basically it will decide what the subject is. In this case it's going to detect whatever's closest, like that. And then as long as I hold my button down, the shutter release button, halfway, it's going to track that subject. Whoops. Play with this feature and understand what the camera will do and what the camera can't do. It's always good to know the limits of your tools, but that's how that function works. That's pretty cool. I also want to talk about the metering modes because they've added some new ones and it's not readily obvious what some of these new ones do. But first, let me go through the basics of the metering and I'm going to demonstrate that using this LED There we go. Uh, nice, bright LED light. And that's how we're going to st start with spot metering here. Uh, let me change my metering mode to... Right now it's in multi-second metering, which, I, which is uh, my go-to metering pattern. And when something bright is introduced into the composition... Oops! Notice that it tries to uh, take things into account, but also balance things out for the center. It's impossible because the, the dynamic range of the scene actually exceeds what the camera can capture. So your lights are actually blowing out. But it's doing a reasonable job of getting the average of the background and the bright light. As good as the camera can get though. What else can we do? Spot metering is a classic way to handle difficult light. You notice there is a circle in the center of the frame. And the way spot metering works is it completely ignores everything outside that circle. Notice that the basic exposure isn't changing much. 100% of the exposure is determined by whatever is inside there. And if it's outside that circle, it just completely ignores it. Completely. So, in the olden days, that spot would never ever move. Which is fine. If I was shooting a rock concert and I wanted to expose just for the guitar player who is lit very well but the background is not, what would I do? I would put that circle over the face of the guitar player, I would hit my AEL toggle button, which will tell the camera, see whatever's in that circle, expose for that, and then lock the exposure until I tell you otherwise. Then you can zoom out, recompose, and shoot, and your exposure is locked, and then you can do whatever you need. That circle has never moved before. Sony has now finally introduced a feature which correlates where the circle is with your spot focusing point. Because remember, Focusing and exposure are not the same thing. Let me give you a quick demo of that. So first let me point out that it's only paying attention to whatever's in the circle. So right now it's trying to make that white piece of cardboard look 18% gray. But if I put something black in front of it, it's going to say, oh my gosh, look how black that is. I need to let in more light to make that look 18% gray because I don't know whether that thing's black or white or not. I've been programmed at the factory to take the average light level of everything and make it look 18% gray. So that's what it's doing. So it's gray there, it's gray there, and you can see the background exposure changing. All right, now let's say I wanted to focus on one thing, but expose for the other. I'm in wide area AF right now, and as you can see, it'll focus, whoops, it'll focus on whatever's closest, unless it doesn't. Oh, come on. There we go. It'll focus whatever's on, clo what, on whatever's closest, and it'll expose for whatever's in the center. Let's switch those. Let's put that in the center, and let's make this closer. 
It'll focus on whatever's closest and then expose for whatever's in the center. So the two, generally speaking, are uncoupled. Now there's a new feature that Sony has introduced, which allows the camera to move the spot metering point to follow where the spot focusing point is. And here's how to get to it. Hit the menu. Uh, it's on page seven. There it is. Exposure one. Down there it's called spot metering point. Normally it's in the, in the center because that's where it's always been since 1952. Focus point link means if you have spot focusing, it'll move that spot. Let's switch to spot focusing now. Function. Let's move to focus area. And let's go a flexible spot, which is just the one square. There it is in the center. Now it's kind of hard to see because there's a target there. And you can see the spot focusing, that's a rectangle in the center, and the spot metering, which is a circle around the spot focusing point. I can move that spot focusing point around and the spot metering circle follows it. So no matter where you are, if you're focusing on something, it's going to expose for something. Just that. So what are the other new metering modes that Sony has introduced? Are they useful? <laughs> well, let's have a look. First, let me switch the focus area back to wide. Then let's get over to metering mode. One of the metering modes is centered. This puts you back in the 1960s if you had a Nikon with center weighted metering. With center weighted metering, with center weighted metering, the camera places greater emphasis on what's in the center versus what's in the corners. In fact, it almost ignores what's in the corners as it gets closer and closer to the center. It takes the light more and more seriously. This was Nikon metering back in the days of the F2AS. Cool. What else is in there? Well, you've got something called a new one called Entire Screen Average. And it does kind of what you expect it to do. It averages everything together regardless of where it is. As you can see, it's not too different from what multi-segment metering does in this difficult metering situation. Um, I can't think of a reason to invoke it. You know, multi-segment metering works pretty well for me. Uh, there's another one here which is kind of useful. This is called Highlight. And again, another scenario with this is good is shooting rock concerts. And I would demonstrate this to you if only they allowed me to bring cameras into rock concerts. They don't do that anymore. But basically, what the camera is going to do is put it into itself into average metering mode. It will manage everything together. It will pick the brightest part of the image, assume that that is your subject, and it will meter for that, regardless of where it is within the frame. Well, how is that different from the uh, ability to have the spot focus and the spot metering track each other? Uh, the effective result is not much different. There's a third one I haven't talked about, and that's multi-segment metering mode. Nikon invented this, Sony brought it to new heights, because instead of breaking up the frame into five different zones, like Nikon did with the FA back in the 1980s, this one, every single pixel on your sensor is an exposure point, and it compares everything together with a little tiny database of bad pictures that has been programmed into the camera at the factory. Let's say you have a picture of someone who's backlit. This camera knows what a backlit person looks like, because whatever's in the center is going to be darker than whatever's behind. At the factory, they said, if you ever see a light distribution that looks like this, it's probably a backlit person overexposed by one and a half stops. So it can get you the correct kind of metering in a wider variety of bad lighting situations. It works remarkably well. It has a great track record. And for that reason, I keep that on as my default. The only time I ever take it off is I have difficult lighting. So those are the most unintuitive aspects of the Sony Alpha 99 II. If you'd like to learn more about every obscure nook and cranny of every menu feature, I can highly recommend an ebook which I authored. And you can purchase right down here. It's available in several different formats. You'll really understand your tool, and it's a minimal investment. Thanks so much for watching, and enjoy your Alpha 99 II.